You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody. It is so awesome to be here at the Thinking Talmudist Podcast, the live class. It's awesome to see people here, people online on Zoom, and also, hopefully, people will be joining us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, all of the other incredible platforms that are available. And I believe firmly that Hashem created all of these resources so that we have a way to disseminate Torah to the entire world. Hashem didn't just create things so that they be for news media and for their, for the other nonsense out there. It's for Torah. To, everything Hashem created was for Torah to be disseminated to the entire world. So we're going to take our responsibility, hopefully, and continue to share our Torah to the entire globe. Amen. Okay, we are studying the Tractate Sota, page 11a, which discusses many of the verses that are in this week's Parsha, Parsha Shmos, the first Parsha in the book of Exodus. Now, just to bring us up to date, The book of Genesis is a little bit more than 2,200 years of history, the first 2,200 years since the creation of Adam and Eve on that sixth day of creation till Joseph dies. And the whole first book of the Torah deals with the ancestors, with the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Jewish people. Exodus, the book of Exodus, talks about the Jewish people. The first was the family of Israel, and now is the people of Israel. We descended down to Egypt, 70 people. That's it. All we had was 70 people. We arrive at the gates of Egypt. Yocheved is born. She's number 70. Yocheved, who's going to be Moshe's mother. And that's the 70 people who go into exile in Egypt. And when we leave, we leave with over 3 million people. There's a lot that transpires. We'll see that as they oppress them, as they agonize them, they were more and more fruitful and they were more successful. They were... Every time they beat the Jews, they had another six kids. And they said that every pregnancy carried six babies. According to some opinions, it's even more than that. So try to keep up with that. You try to beat them. You try to kill their babies. And they have six more. And then six more. And then six more. And then six more. Do the math. Before you know it, in only 210 years of slavery, they amassed over 3 million people that left Egypt when the Jewish people left not too long after that. That is a whole nation. All right, so the Gemara now turns to the next section of the Mishnah, which applies the principle of measure for measure to reward for good deeds. So we know this. We talked about this actually in our uh, Partial Review podcast yesterday. There is always a measure for measure, a reward for reward for good deeds. You do a good deed, you get a reward for it measure for measure. And sometimes that measure is even greater. It's even greater than the deed. Let's see. V'chein le'inyan hatova miriam. And so too, with regard to the good, which which good? Miriam. She waited for Moses one hour when, she, when her mother, Yochevet, placed her in the reeds, in the Nile, in the basket. Miriam waited. She waited for an hour. Because she waited for an hour, therefore Israel delayed for her seven days in the wilderness. The Gemara asks, me dummy, are these even comparable? Hasam Chadashaita, when Miriam waited, it was just one hour. Hacha Shivayomi, and now when the Jewish people delayed and waited for Miriam, it was seven days. So what are you talking about? It's a, 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 a deed for a deed. She waited for Moshe one hour, and the Jewish people waited for her for seven days. That's not an equal reward. The Gemara answers, Amar Abayah, Abayah said, Emo, 
Ule'inyan hatova eno kein. Say that the Mishnah means, but for good it is not so. Meaning, commentary says, that is, whereas a person is punished measure for measure, he is rewarded in greater measure for the good action he performed. Thus, punishment and reward are not alike, say the commentaries. The reward and the punishment are not equal. The reward is far greater than the deed. The punishment is equal, eye for an eye, to the deed that was done. So if someone does a sin, they get punished for the sin. Equally, if someone does a good deed, they get rewarded far greater for that good deed. The Gemara objects, but Rava says to him, but the Mishnah taught as so too for good, clearly stating when it says so too, it means the same thing, just like it is for bad, so too it is for good, stating that the principle of measure for measure applies to reward in the same way that it does for punishment. The Rava therefore suggests another answer. Ella Amar Rava, Rava says, This is what the Mishnah is teaching. And so too for the good, mida that the person is rewarded in the measure, in a similar fashion. But actually, God's measure of kindness, of beneficence, is greater than his measure of retribution, so that the reward will be quantitatively greater than the action itself. So now the Gemara elaborates on the verse that describes Miriam's action. What happened? And this is in this week's parsha. Vatesatsev achoso mirochok. His sister stationed herself from afar to know what would be done to Moses. Amr Rabbi Yitzchok. Rabbi Yitzchok said, "Pasuk ze kulo al shem shchino nemar." This entire verse is stated regarding the divine presence. What does that mean? That means. The verse is worded in such a way to teach us that the divine presence stood with Miriam, so to speak, until Moses was saved. So let's just put put ourselves into the shoes of this story. What's going on over here? Here you have Pharaoh making a decree that all Jewish baby boys should be killed. Who are the midwives? Miriam and Yucheved, who are called Shifra and Pua, do not obey the decrees of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh says even worse, even more. What do babies have to do? Babies have to be thrown into the Nile River. So Yocheved has her own baby. She puts him into the Nile. And then what happens? Miriam stands by and watches. Now, I ask you a question. Would any of us put our baby into a basket in the Nile? I mean, what was Yocheved thinking? I mean, there were plenty of other babies that survived. There were plenty of other babies that weren't subject to being put into a little box, into a little ark, and put into the, into the river. So why is Moshe placed into this river? And why is Miriam, what does she think is going to happen by standing there? Let's say someone comes and takes the baby, knocks him over, right? So now he's drowning in the sea, drowning in the river. What's going to happen? She's going to run and save him? So what we need to understand here is that the entire experience of what's going on is beyond our comprehension. And why is it beyond our comprehension? Because when you see the hand of God operating, none of it makes sense to us. We look at things and we say, one second, shouldn't that be person be getting something? Shouldn't that be happening? Shouldn't that be happening? That's because we have a very limited mind in how we see the operations of the world. But the way God operates the world is very different. And therefore, the Talmud tells us here that what was really happening with Miriam was the Shekhinah. It was the presence of the Almighty that was protecting him and guiding so that, in a way that doesn't even make sense, if you asked Yochevet, she'd say like, I don't even know why I put him in the river. But yet she put him in because that's what God wanted to happen. God wanted Moshe to be in that river, in the reeds, 
so that Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, will see the little boat holding Moshe, and she'll pull him out. She'll pull him out of the water, and she'll bring him into the palace, and then already you have your inside man, your spy inside the palace. And it seems like, like imagine if you're able to get someone into the White House and they're able to become an advisor. And we'll see soon the Talmud says that Pharaoh had three advisors, of which one of them was Job. And according to our sages, Job was Moses. Okay, we'll see this. We'll see the Talmud later. We'll get to it. The other two was Yisro and Bilam, his advisors. So Moshe was an advisor here, potentially. We'll see. Again, it's one of the opinions. He gets into the, into the, and we, we sometimes think, and think of, think of what the mother is thinking. <gasps> My child was taken away. My child was abducted. My child was, ta- I put him into the, she comes back and she's like, My baby's gone. I mean, what mother would be calm about that? And then Miriam works out a deal that Yocheved, Moshe's mother, should be nursing him because he wouldn't nurse from any of the Egyptian women because he said the mouth that's going to speak to the presence of the Almighty can't nurse from a non-Jewish woman. So, I mean, all of these events, you go into it, it's like, it's remarkable to see the hand of Hashem guiding every step of the way, picking us up here, dropping us off there, taking us from there, moving us to the next place. Things that we're like, what's going on? We have no idea. Sometimes we're able to have an idea of what's going on. Sometimes we have, the majority of the time, we have no idea what's going on. Hashem is running the world the way Hashem runs the world, not the way we think he should run the world. The Talmud now continues. Rav Yitzchak demonstrates how each word of the verse alludes to the divine presence. Vatesatzav, and she stood, dichsev, vayavo Hashem, vayisyatsev, for it is written elsewhere in Samuel 1, chapter 3, verse 10. It says, vayavo Hashem, vayisyatsev. God came and stood. So we see that because it uses the same terminology, it refers that over here too, Hashem stood with Miriam when she stood to watch at the river. Meirachok, from afar. It says that she stood from afar. Yichsiv Meirachok Hashem Nirali. It also says elsewhere in Jeremiah 31, verse 2. Yichsiv Meirachok Hashem Nirali. For it is written, from afar Hashem appeared to me. Ladea. To know, what does it say, Ladea? She wanted to know what was going to happen with, with Moses. It says in the verse in Samuel 1, chapter 2, verse 3, because Hashem is the God of knowledge. Ma, what, what is happening with Moshe? What is Hashem, your Lord, asking of you? That's in Deuteronomy. Ye ose, ma ye ose, what's going to happen to Moshe? What would be done? Dixiv, ki lo yaase Hashem alokim dover. For it is written in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, because Hashem the Lord will not do something. Lo to him, to Moshe, dixiv vayikra lo Hashem shalom. And he called it Hashem. Peace, and that is in Judges 6.24. That is, Hashem is the source of our peace. So, here you go. The entire verse, each word of the verse is sourced in our prophets and writings, showing us that all of what happened over there with Miriam standing by the shore of the river was Hashem watching over Moshe. Hashem was there watching over Moshe and protecting him. So just so that we understand, Hashem is always watching over us. Hashem is always protecting us. And what we sometimes feel is like, where is God? God is right there. He's right there. My rabbi said something that is so incredible. When I was on this recent trip in Israel, he said many people argue that, well, we can't see Hashem. 
we can't see Hashem. If I can only see Hashem, I'd believe in Hashem. He says that's patently false. Of course you can see Hashem. Hashem is everywhere. He's right there in front of you. And while Hashem doesn't use words to communicate with us, Hashem uses actions to communicate with us. What are better, words or actions? You know, someone says, say someone hits your car and says, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll fix it. And then you never hear from them again. So what, what do the words mean? They nothing. Someone comes and actually repairs it. And someone hurts your feelings and says, I'm sorry, and hurts your feelings again, and says, I'm sorry, and hurts your feelings again. What are the words? The words don't mean anything. But when someone takes action and changes and does what is necessary to be done, that's a different story. Action over words. Hashem communicates to us through actions, not through words. Now, there's also words. There are messages that people tell us. There are things that people say to us that are, what? Why did they say that? That's Hashem communicating through people. Okay, the Gemara begins an in-depth analysis of the scriptural passage that describes the beginning of the Egyptian exile. Vayaka melachadash. And again, all of these verses are in our Parsha, in this week's Torah portion, in Parsha Shemos. Vayaka melachadash. And a new king arose over Egypt. Rav Shmuel, Rav and Shmuel disputed the meaning of this verse. Chad Amar Chodosh Mamish. One said that it refers to a genuinely new king, like a new king. Vechad Amar Shinis Chachu Xerosov. And one says that only his decrees were new. So the commentary here says, the Maharal says, the second view should not be taken literally, which the second view was that it was a, it was the same king, but with new decrees. He says it is unlikely, it should not be taken literally to mean that the original Pharaoh from Joseph's time was still alive, for it is unlikely that a wicked person would be granted such a long life. Rather, it means that he was the son or grandson of the original Pharaoh so that the kingdom was still intact. He is called new only because of his new decrees. The other view, though, holds that the original kingdom had crumbled and this new pharaoh was unrelated to the one of Joseph's times. That's what the Maharal tells us. Okay, so now the Gemara continues. The Gemara gives the basis for each opinion. Man de Omar Chadash Mamesh, according to the opinion that he was genuinely a new king, derives this from the fact that Ksiv Chadash, for the verse states, it was a new king. And the one, the opinion that sides that only his decrees were new, derives this from the fact, because nowhere is it written that the previous king died and that the new king reigned in his stead. So because it doesn't say that there was a departure of the old king and now a new king, that's why this opinion sides with the idea that it was a new decree from a child or grandchild of the previous pharaoh. The verse continues, Ashalo yodas Yosef, who did not know Joseph. The Gemara explains, the havidami keman lo yodale klal. It means that he seemed like one who did not know Joseph at all. He passed harsh decrees against the Jewish people as if he had never known Joseph. So this is an interesting thing. That means... Uh, you know, you wonder, you look at the American political scene today and you have politicians that, you know, act in a way that they don't even recognize their constituents who brought them in. They don't recognize the people who trained them. They don't recognize and they go out on their own and do crazy things or make crazy decrees or try to pass crazy legislation without realizing where they're coming from, without realizing their history, without realizing their their source. And here is a new king who doesn't realize that the entire Egypt was saved because of Yosef, because that's the way things work. You know, it's like when when someone is is impoverished, someone is poor, and they get a handout, they say, look, if you're just able to help me, I, I'll pay you back in, 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 in spades. I'll pay you back in every way possible. And then when they do win that lottery, they're like, who are you? I'm sorry. Like what? You're, you, you once helped me? You once what? I have no idea who you are. 
And it's it, there's there's a, there's a, an element that people can have which is which is called kafui tov, which is not recognizing, not appreciating the good that they benefited from. And that's something we have to be very careful of because the Jewish people are all about appreciation and gratitude and giving thanks and recognizing the good that they benefited from. Never to take that for granted and never to to, uh, to overlook it. Okay, the Talmud now continues. The next verse states, Vayomer alamo, hine am Yisrael. He said to his people, this is Pharaoh, Behold, the people, the children of Israel, are more numerous and stronger than we. The Gemara elaborates, Tana, the Brisa taught, Hu hitchil be'etza He was first to offer the suggestion of acting against the Jews. Lafikach laka tchila. Therefore, he was stricken first. Pharaoh was stricken first. Hu hitchil be'etza tchila. He was first to offer the suggestion. Dichsev. Why? Because it says, Vayomer alamo. And he said, it is written, that he said to his people, Lafikach laka tchila. Therefore, he was stricken first. Kedichsev, as it says in the verse, as it says, into you and into your people and into your servants will the frogs ascend. So it was very clearly, like we said, an eye for an eye. He was first to suggest something against the Jewish people. He was the first to get punished for his actions. Pharaoh then said, Havan is chakmolo. Come, let us act wisely concerning it. The Gemara asks, Lohemi Boyle. He should have said, Let us act wisely concerning them. Why concerning it? The Gemara answers, Omer of Choma Barab Hanina, of Choma, the son of Rab Hanina said, Bo'u Venechkam Lemoshion shall Yisrael. What Pharaoh meant to say is, Let us act wisely concerning the Savior of Israel, meaning God. Bame Nidunain. With what can we meet out judgment upon the Israelites without fear of retribution? Idunan be'esh. If we judge them with fire, God will certainly punish us with fire. Ksiv, ki hine Hashem be'esh yavo. It is written, for behold, Hashem will arrive in fire to vent his anger with wrath. Ksiv, ki va'esh Hashem nishpat. And it says, for Hashem will enter into judgment with fire. So what happened? The Egyptians realized from history that Hashem punishes eye for an eye. He punished the people of the great flood of Noah's generation. He punished the people of Sodom. An act for an act, a deed for a deed. So they were trying to outsmart Hashem. The Egyptians knew that God punished people measure for measure from the episode of the flood and from the destruction of Sodom, they therefore sought counsel, says Rashi, on how to outwit God. So what happens? So Pharaoh then said, Bechorev, if we judge them with the sword, God will certainly punish us with the sword. As it is written in continuation of the just cited verse, and with his sword against all flesh, Pharaoh therefore concluded, Rather, let us judge them with water. God already promised that he'll never bring a flood to the world. So if we punish them with water by throwing their babies into the water, then we won't be punished with water because God said he's not going to flood us, right? He's not going to do it anymore. Shinemar ki mei noach zosli as it states, for like the waters of Noah shall this be to me, Isaiah 54, as I have sworn never again to pass the water of Noah over the earth, this argument yielded the plan to drown the Israelite babies. Behain enon yodim. But they did not know, shall kol ha'olam kulo enomevi, that God swore only that he would not bring the flood over the entire world. Aval aluma achasumevi. But over one nation, he reserved the right to bring a flood. Inami, alternatively, they did not realize that who enomevi that God would not bring the flood waters upon a nation. Avalhain bain v'noflim b'sochob, but he could arrange the matters so that they would come and fall into the water themselves. And like we see by the splitting of the sea 
and that the Egyptians were drowned in it. And it says the Egyptians were fleeing toward it, towards the water. They themselves brought themselves to drown into the water. So Hashem kept his word, and the Egyptians had a plan. The Gemara supports this exposition. And this is what Rebbe Leza said. What is the meaning of that which is written? For, what, for with that which they schemed Zadu against them, they themselves were punished. Whatever they planned against the Jewish people is exactly what they were punished with. Since Scripture chooses the word Zadu, which means that they schemed against them, which can also be a reference to cooking. The verse alludes to the following, In the pot in which the Egyptians cooked, they themselves were cooked. The scheme was reversed and placed right on them. The Gemara questions the basis of this allusion. What implies that the word zadu, schemed, is an expression of cooking in a pot? The Gemara answers, Because it's written by Jacob when Esav came from the field and wanted something to eat. What does it say there? And Yaakov cooked Vayazed, a dish, Nazid, and that's the same term as used by Pharaoh, Asher Zadu, that they schemed that they were cooking up a plan that eventually would come and eat them. They would be punished from that. The Gemara further describes the circumstances surrounding Pharaoh's decree against the Jews. Amar Rav Chia Baraba, Amar Rav Simai. Rav Chia Baraba said in the name of Rav Simai, Shlosha Hoyu Ba'osa Eitzah, three people were involved in offering that counsel to Pharaoh. Bilam, the Eo, the Yisro. Bilam, Job, and Yisro. There is a tradition that these three men were the advisors of Pharaoh at the time. The Sfasemis notes that the Torah speaks of only two that gave advice, using the word Eitzah, and that was Yisro and Bilam. In those cases, two, Yisro's advice was beneficial to Israel, while Bilam's was to its detriment. So now the Talmud continues, Bilam, Bilam, who counseled Pharaoh, to drown the Jewish babies was slain. And we see that he was killed during the Israelites' campaign against Midian. This punishment was measure for measure for advising that the Israelite babies be killed. He himself was killed. The Gemara states above that Pharaoh himself was the first to propose this such a plan. Our Gemara calls the scheme the council of Bilam because he endorsed it. Alternatively, it is possible that Pharaoh was the first to propose action against the Jews, but the actual plan was Bilam's. So we see again a eye for an eye method of punishment. Eov Sheshasak. Job, who was silent, neither suggesting to Pharaoh that he drowned the Israelite babies, nor advising him not to, Nidom Yisurun was punished by having to undergo suffering. One who was able to protect against the wrongdoing of others, but remain silent, is punished. The punishment of suffering was measure for measure because one who is afflicted with suffering cries out from the pain. This was just punishment for Job's failure to open his mouth in defense of the Israelites. Even if Job did not protest because he knew that he was not going to be successful in changing Pharaoh's mind. He was nevertheless punished measure for measure for one cries when he suffers, even though he knows that doing so will not alleviate his suffering. Similarly, Job should have voiced his objection to Pharaoh's plan, although he knew that doing so would not change Pharaoh's mind in the end. Job told Pharaoh to spare the Jews' lives, but to take away their possessions and enslave them. For this, Job was punished measure for measure, and God later gave almost exactly the same instruction to the Satan, to Satan, with regards to Job. So, Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, the famed Rosh Hashiva 
of the Mir, the great Mir Yeshiva, brings out another point from this Gemara. He says, at first glance, it would seem that Job's punishment was worse than that of Bilam. For Job suffered the worst types of suffering, while Bilam died a quick death. This seems unfair, since Bilam certainly acted more evilly than Job in advising Pharaoh how to defeat Israel. Reb Chaim derives from this that the gift of life is more precious even when one must suffer. Thus, Job, who suffered, was better off than Bilam, even though Job had to undergo terrible suffering. So Reb Chaim Shmulevitz teaches us something so incredible. Life is so precious. Life is so such a great gift. I'll tell you, my great-grandfather, Reb Avram Grudzinski, who was the, one of the leading sages in the, in the Kovna ghetto in Slobatka. He was a great rabbi. And, uh, when the Germans, when the Nazis, Yamach Shemam Vizichram, may their memories be erased and destroyed from this world. So when those evil Nazis came to their town and they found my grandfather who was, my great grandfather who was a, a handicapped individual, they're like, oh, you're not feeling well. Come, let's take you to the hospital. They took him to the hospital and they burnt the entire hospital with all of the patients inside, all of the Jewish patients inside. My great-grandfather, when he was taken to the hospital, he asked his students, he said, please do me a favor and move my bed away from the wall. Because he knew, he anticipated that they were going to burn down the entire hospital. He said, move my bed away from the wall so I'll live a few extra seconds. That's how precious life is. A few extra seconds of life. And this is what Reb Chaim Shmulevit says here. It's still better to live a life, albeit with suffering, is still better than dying. Therefore, Job's punishment was still less of a punishment than Bilam's. Talmud continues. Yisro Shabarach Zachu Mibnei Banav Sheyeshvu Belishka Sagazis. As for Yisro, who fled in protest, he didn't say nothing. He ran away. He says, no. His descendants merited to sit in the chamber of hewn stone in the temple as members of the Sanhedrin. Shinemar umishpacho sofrim yoshve yavets, shim osim, shuchosim, hema hakinim haboim, machmas avi beis revav. As it states, the family of the scribes, dwellers of yavets, the Tirathites, the Shimathites, and the Suchatites, I hope I'm pronouncing them properly, they are the Kenites who are descended from Hamath, father of the house of Rechav. Ruxiv, Ubnei, Keni, Chosen, Moshe. And it is written, the children of the Kenite, the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law. And he went up to the city of palm trees. We thus see that the Kenites described in the previously cited verse as scribes, sages, were descendants of Yisrael. So who were the members, who were some of the members of the Sanhedrin? The children of Yisrael. Why did Yisrael merit to this? He merited to this because he protested against Pharaoh's evil advice of causing pain to the Jewish people. So we see something very, very important, very fascinating. If you see something, say something. You see something evil happening, don't just walk by. Like people, they have so many studies of people uh, mugging, raping, harming, beating people in New York City. And people just walk by like nobody's business. Over here we see from Yisro, from the whole story of what happened with Pharaoh, it is incumbent upon us when we see something harmful, we see something that's not good, something wicked happening, it is incumbent upon us to do something, to say something, and not just stand by and let it happen. Because Bilam advised against, he got punished. Job didn't say anything. He just stood by. You know, the, the Talmud t- t- teaches us, Shtika kehoda. Silence means you're agreeing. But what did Yisro do? Yisro ran out of the, the Congress. He ran out of the, pal- of the palace of Pharaoh in protest for what Pharaoh was about to do. 
he merited that his children, his descendants, ended up sitting in the Sanhedrin. That's the reward for taking a stand. Yes. Okay, the Gemara resumes its exposition of Pharaoh's discourse. If a war will occur, it too may join our enemies and fight us and go up from the land. So Pharaoh is worried that the Jewish people are going to gang up against the Egyptians and then go up to their land. The Gemara asks, Pharaoh should have said, and we will go up from the land. Why does it say, and they will go up? Fight us and go up from the land. What, why does he say? Why does it, why does it include, and we will? The more answers, Amar of Abba Bar Kahana, or of Abba Bar Kahana says, Ke Odom It is like a person who curses himself. Vitola but applies his curse to others. Thus, Pharaoh actually was worried that the Israelites would triumph in war and force the Egyptians out of the land, out of their own land. But Pharaoh did not want to speak openly about such a bad thing happening to himself. Hence, he spoke euphemistically. And they will... It is interesting to note that Pharaoh's spoken words indeed came true. Israel went up from the land to receive the Torah at Sinai, and from there went up further to Eretz Yisrael. So it was the Jewish people, actually, who ended up going up to the land. It wasn't the Egyptians who were kicked out of their land, which is what Pharaoh was. So it's like he prophesied but didn't know what he was prophesying, right? The next verse says, Vayasimu lov sarimisim, and they appointed taskmasters. I get that word wrong all the time. Taskmasters over them. The Gemara asks, Alehem mi It should have said that they appointed taskmasters over them, not over it. Why does the verse say it in the singular? The Gemara answers, Tana de Be'er Lazar Barabi Shimon, the Tana in the academy of Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, taught, it teaches that they brought a brick mold. And they hung it on Pharaoh's neck. Then, whenever one of the Israelites said to the Egyptians, you know, I'm a delicate nature, I'm unable to work, Amr lo klum istinis ati yosim Pharaoh. Are you more delicate of nature than Pharaoh? Thus, the singular him used in the verse was an allusion to Pharaoh. Why? Vaisimu alav, they placed it on Pharaoh. And then everyone said, oh, are you greater than Pharaoh? Pharaoh's got a, uh, a brick mold on him. You too are no less than he is. Uh, the Gemara expounds the verse's term of taskmasters according to this interpretation, sarimisim, according to the aforementioned exposition. Taskmasters refers not to officers, but to davar shemesim levenim, a thing that coerces. The verse continues, lamana nosem in order to afflict him with their burdens. The Gemara asks, anosam nibayalei, it should have stated, in order to afflict them. Why to afflict him? The Gemara answers, Laman anoso le Pharaoh besivlosam. The verse means, in order to afflict Pharaoh with regard to the burdens of Israel. And the commentary here says the teaching is in line with the previous one. Pharaoh pretended to be afflicted in order that the Israelites should volunteer to work hard to help ease Pharaoh's burden. So it was all a ploy. Bechain. And now the verse, uh, the, the Talmud continues. The verse continues. By Yivain Ari Miskinos Lofaro, and it built storage cities, Miskinos, for Pharaoh. The Gemara expounds the term Miskinos used here. Rav Shmuel, a disagreement between Rav and Shmuel. Chad Omer Shemisaknos es Balehem. One said that these cities endangered their owners. The Chad Omer Shemimaskinos es Balehem. And the other opinion says that it impoverished their owners. The Amar Mar, for the master, said, Call Haosik Bibinyon Mismaskin. Anyone who engages in construction becomes poor. So the commentary here says, Because of the forced labor, the Egyptians lost 
all of their possessions to the Jews. So you made them build. You became poor. You're the builder. You're the one involved in construction. You end up becoming poor. Just it's a sign of the, again, the act for an act, the measure for measure that Hashem punishes evildoers. So, my dear friends, have a magnificent Shabbos. Thank you so much. Next week, God willing, we'll continue this Talmud in Sota, and we're at the bottom of the page of 11a. Hashem should bless us with a wonderful Shabbos, a very peaceful Shabbos, an uplifting Shabbos, a connected Shabbos, an elevated and delicious Shabbos. I just want to share with you a beautiful thought. A beautiful thought. So I was learning last night with my study partner. We were learning some Hasidus, some Hasidic teachings. He says, to elevate the food, you need to think. Food is a very physical, materialistic object, but nothing was made in this world just to be as a materialistic, physical thing. Everything was made with it a potential to elevate. See, he says, what tools do we have to elevate food? He says, the most simplest way is to just be happy that you have food. To be happy that you have delicious food. That's already the greatest tool of elevating. Of course, take it to the next level would be to be appreciative that you have food that can sustain your body so that you can become enriched, so you can become stronger, so that you can serve Hashem. But he says that's the next level. The first is just be happy, be grateful, be thankful. Of course, we recite a blessing before we eat. We recite a blessing thanking Hashem after we eat. But to just be grateful that we have food and that we have delicious food, you're happy from it, that itself elevates our experience. My dear friends, have a great Shabbos. Thank you.